John chapter 5, as we continue this series, A Hope in All Circumstances, we're looking for a hope that we have. Hope through struggles, hope through trials, hope through difficulties to make sure that we point people to a hope that we have. Ultimately, that hope is found in Jesus Christ. And as you turn to John chapter 5 this morning, I want to talk to you about pain. How many of you have or experience pain? Anybody have pain? They woke up and they go, oh, my leg hurts. Well, recently... I got old on you. I'm sorry. And I start to hurt. I hurt, not all the time, but any day that ends in Y, well, it hurts. <laughs> Hearing no amen, you no one commiserates with me. <clears throat> so you hit the Tylenol, you hit the Advil, oh, my muscles hurt. I need some Bengay. Recently, I had some back trouble, so I had to go see the chiropractor. He told me, boy, you're way out of line. And I looked at him and I said, Doc, you got to stop cracking me up. <laughs> he goes, you're out of line. I said, I know, that's why I'm here. Uh. He goes, you're kind of tight. I said, I know. So he's been working on things. Things have been moving. Things have been working better. We don't like to be in pain. We avoid everything for pain. I did a study, and the greatest thing I could find was, or latest thing, was 2016. In 2016, it was estimated that Americans spent almost $10,000 a person to avoid pain. That's $3.1 trillion we spent to avoid pain in our life. As we think about those in pain and those struggling, what hope do we have? What hope do we have to offer people that are struggling and hurting because we have a reason for the hope? What hope do we have? So the question I have for this morning, it's the bookends, the beginning and the end, is what hope do I have to offer during physical struggles? Well, from today's passage, we're going to be challenged to go and show compassion. Second one is we want to point people to the creator, not that which was created. We're going to leave here with the challenge to each one help one. We can't help them all, but we can help one. And then finally, we're going to be challenged to walk in obedience to what Jesus has called us and commanded us to do. So that's our passage, that's our framework for this morning as we turn to John chapter 5. Let's look at God's word. After these things, well these things point us back to context. It causes us to ask the question, what's going on? We want to read with 2020 vision. So the things that are going on is there was a healing of the official son. Also what happened is Jesus turned water into wine in John chapter 2 in Canaan where Jesus had a reputation for miracles. Jesus is moving from the region of Cana down to Jerusalem and he's got this movement that's happening. The people are talking about Jesus because of what he is doing. The miracles that he is performing and people are starting to follow him. And after these things, there was a feast. There were three feasts of what are called obligation that the Jewish people had to go to. There was the feast of the Passover, the feast of Pentecost, or the feast of the tabernacle. All three of those feasts were mandatory feasts that people had to go to Jerusalem. John doesn't tell us which of those three mandatory feasts there is, but people are migrating to Jerusalem. And Jesus never wants to miss an opportunity to preach to a crowd. So instead of going out to the people, he finds where the crowd is, and he's going to go and he's going to preach and teach about his mission. His mission that he has come to die for them. So Jesus is going up to Jerusalem, and there was by Jerusalem, there was this sheep gate, and there was a pool. And while there, 
In Hebrew, it's called Bethesda. Some call it Bethesda, some call it Bethsaida. I go back and forth with both of them. So there's this pool there in Hebrew called Bethesda, which means it's the house of grace. And this house of grace had a pool in the middle, and there are five porches. Perhaps it looks something like this, where there would be crowds of people gathered so they could have the water for their animals, but they could also have shade for them to get them out of the sun. There could also be a time of rest and relaxation in the heat of the day. So Jesus is going there. There is this pool of grace, this pool of Bethesda. Now, in this pool of Bethesda laid a multitude. Don't watch or glaze over this. Don't miss this. A multitude is a group of people. I looked at the Greek word for this. I couldn't find how many people are there. What I do know is it was a great number. As you think through the story of Christmas, there was a multitude of angels that sang out, praising God in the highest, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to all men. There's also a multitude that follow Jesus. There is a crowd. So at this pool, there is a crowd of people. Don't miss that. Underline that. Highlight that. That is going to be important. So there's this group of people who were gathered there. There's a group of people gathered that have similar struggles. What are they? They are sick. They are blind. They are lamed. And they are withered. People that are facing difficult struggles and trials in their life are gathered together around this pool of grace underneath one of these five porches. And it makes sense because the porches are going to offer them shade, but there's also hope that they have. What hope do they have? Well, if you look in your scriptures, in your Bible, if you have the ESV, English Standard Version, you have no verse 4. If you have the NASB, New American Standard, which is what we use here at the church, it's bracketed. All, most translations will bracket it, some will pull it out, because commentators all agree that this was not part of the original manuscript. Scribes added it later on to help set the context, because we read this and we go, we don't understand why they were gathered there. So verse 3b and 4 tell us why. They were gathered, the lame were there, the, the paralyzed were there. They were gathered there waiting for the movement of the waters. You see, they believed that the waters would stir and that was God sending down his grace that the first one to get into the pool would be healed. It was God showing his grace. So the waters that moved, that was the sign that the angel had stuck his finger in there and were stirring the waters. You see, they had hope. They had faith. It just was in the created, not in the creator. So they would wait for the movement of the waters, for the angel of the Lord went out at a certain season into the pool and stirred up the water. Now we looked and have done studies. That pool is fed by an underground spring. So anytime water would come in and bubble up, it's all the physic or physical science of it. But people in a hopeless situation are looking for hope. And just imagine the, the chaos that would have happened when that bubble started to ripple. Have you ever been there where you have a physical ailment and all you want is relief? Tylenol won't touch it, Advil won't touch it, Bengay won't touch it, the prescriptions, you're just in constant pain. All you want is relief from that pain. That's where these people are. And they're sitting there with bated breath, waiting for a bubble, because that's the beginning of the stirring. And just imagine the chaos as they're pulling on each other, crawling over each other, trying to be the first one to get in. Not to be funny, but to drive home the point. It reminds me of the time when the girls were younger and it was Black Friday and you had to get up at two in the morning to get that toy. 
Remember the Tickle Me Elmo? You had to get your elbows in there and be first in line and you saw people crawling over each other to get that toy. As silly as a toy is, that's what these people are doing. The first one to get into the pool when the angel stirred. And after the stirring up of the water, stepped into the well and from whatever disease they had, they were healed. This multitude sitting there, waiting for the waters to be stirred. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. Underline that. That's the second highlight of this passage. This guy had been sick or ill for 38 years. Did you know most men that were, quote, healthy never made it to 38 years old? If you are living in biblical times and you're 40, you're an old man. You exceeded the life expectancy. So this guy who has been here for 38 years and intense and purposes, his whole life he has been there and sick waiting for the stirring of this pool. Imagine the hopelessness that he has. Imagine the hope that he has. Where else is he going to go? There's no place else for him to go other than this pool, hoping that he can be the first one in. Some of you have had ailments for weeks and you're ready to be healed. Some of you have struggled with chronic illness for many, many, many years. This man is sitting here, hopeless, waiting for someone to help him get in the water. But someone always beat him to the, to the pool. When Jesus saw him, what's Jesus doing? What's Jesus' purpose? Jesus is heading up to Jerusalem because that's where the crowd of people are. That's the biggest, if you will, bang for his buck that Jesus can have a crowd to go into the temple to teach because he wants everyone to know what his mission is. And so he has a choice. He can go to the temple, he can go and he can teach, or he can be detoured to go to this pool of suffering. And this is where I'm challenged this morning, and I always like to share some vulnerability with you, is sometimes I drive up to the red light. And lately, uh, many people have been out asking for food or asking for money. And my, own, my hope and my prayer is, dear Lord, let the light turn green. Dear Lord, let the light turn green. Dear Lord, let the light turn green. Do I run it red? It's more of a pink. Should I just run it? Because if I stop, I've got this person right here. Do I acknowledge them? Do I look at them? Just look ahead. Just look ahead and pray and hope and turn and pray and hope and turn. Is anybody else with me on this? Okay, I'm the only one great. It's okay. And I've been challenged from last week with our, with our missionaries coming and sharing each of the services. Each one of those people is someone created in God's image. Each one of those people is dearly loved by Jesus, and Jesus came to die for them. And they deserve to be acknowledged. And sometimes we pretend like they're not there so that we don't have to lean into the hurt. Jesus could have easily went to the temple and gone on his way, but instead he made a turn and he leaned into and saw how many are there? A multitude. He went to where the hurt was. He simply just didn't bypass it. Could he have? Yes. Can we? Yes. Should we? Well, that's between you and the Holy Spirit of conviction. So Jesus saw him lying there. As I studied this, I have more questions than answers after I studied this. It seems like the more I study, the more questions I have. So as Jesus saw the man lying there, and Jesus knew that he'd been there for a long time. If you do some study on this, some commentators say that the disciples were leaning into Jesus saying, that guy there, he's been there for 38 years. Well, let's not forget, Jesus is God and he knows everything. Jesus was there when that man was born because Jesus has always been. So Jesus went there, he looked at the man. 
Out of all those ones that were there, Jesus found the one. He knew he'd been there a long time, and in that condition, what condition is that? Well, the lameness, the, the, the paralyzed, he'd been there for a long time. In a state of helplessness, and almost hopelessness, waiting for that water to turn. Jesus looked at the guy and he said to him, do you wish to get well? What a weird thing to say. Why would Jesus ask that question? Perhaps Jesus asked that question to kind of shock the man and no one's asked me if I wanted to get well. Maybe Jesus is asking a rhetorical question. Do you want to get well? Well, of course I want to get well. I'm waiting for the pool to stir so I can get over my physical ailment. But sometimes you ever meet someone that just doesn't want to get better? I just want to stay where I am. I just am content in the state of life that I have. So Jesus looks at him and says, do you wish to get well? Do you want to get better? Do you want to get up and move around? The sick man answered him and said, sir, don't miss this. I missed this the first three readings of, of my time. He, he acknowledges Jesus and calls him sir. That's like me calling you friend, but not know your name. This guy did not know Jesus. He had no knowledge of Jesus. He didn't know who Jesus was or maybe even perhaps what Jesus was doing. And it, I can understand that because this man is at this pool where they're suffering and many people don't come in. And Jesus hasn't had the opportunity to interact with him because this guy can't walk out and follow Jesus. He's lame. He's, he's stuck there. And so Jesus looks at him and says, hey, you want to get better? And the guy turns and says, hey, excuse me, sir, friend. It's a formal greeting. He says, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool. Notice the faith that he has. Notice the hope he has. If I can just get into the pool, then I'm good to go. <laughs> and I'm sitting there looking at this story going, it's Jesus. You're in for a treat. I read the rest of the story. It all, it's all good for you. And the guy doesn't realize that the maker of heaven and earth is talking to him. That the miracle worker is going to work a miracle in his own life. And the guy is at a place of hopelessness. And he says, I just need someone to run point for me. To hold others back or to push me in. I just need to hit the waters when the bubbles come up. When the water is stirred, but while I'm continuing or coming, another steps down before me. Remember verse 4? Verse 4 helps us with the context. And I just laugh at this. It really strikes me as funny every time I read it. Because this guy, the lame man, is telling Jesus how it works. And Jesus is Jesus. He knows it all. And I would just love to be a disciple just sitting back going, oh, this is going to be good. And Jesus comes to him. He acknowledges the hurt. He acknowledges the places that they are. And he looks at him and says, do you really want help? And Jesus looked at this man. And he tells him to get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Notice what he says to him. I want you to get up, pick up, and walk. This man's been here for 38 years one time I twisted an ankle and I was in a boot or something. I shredded an Achilles tendon, had to have surgery and that was interesting and had a two month recovery where I laid on my couch for two months and that was fun for about the first day and a half. And after two months, I had to start walking again and I'd lost a lot of muscle, lost a lot of confidence. Some of you have had surgeries like that. And that first step, boy, you're not really sure. Is this going to hold? Is this going to work? This guy's been there for 38 years. And Jesus looks at him and says, you want to get well? You want to walk out of here? Get up, pick up, and walk. 
And he has the chance and he has the challenge to walk in obedience to what Jesus says. This guy is hopeless. This guy has hope. This guy is faithless, but he has faith. And it's in the wrong things. And so he looks at Jesus, and Jesus looks at him and says, are you ready to be healed? Get up, pick up, and walk. Immediately. I did a really deep study on the Greek word for immediately. You know what it means? Really, 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 really quick. Instantaneous. This man is healed. And I think about this, and I was challenged by it. He became well. Just imagine his response. Just imagine. You think he just got up, picked up his mat, and began to walk out? I can't prove it by scripture, but I bet you he was kind of excited. I think he might have been kind of excited like we get excited at basketball games. He was there and helpless and hopeless. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes in and heals him. He got the very thing that he wanted, but it came from the creator, not what was created. And immediately, the man became well, and he picked up his pallet, and he began to walk. I would love to know the rest of the story. How did he walk? How did he respond? Did he just quietly pick up his mat and just walk out? Or, if you will, did he make a scene? I can only speak for me and my personality. I would probably make a scene. And not to bring attention to me, but because I was there for 38 years, and I'm healed. And he took up his mat, and he walked out. Here's your challenge. How many people were there? A multitude. How many did Jesus heal? One. Could Jesus have healed them all? Yes. But from this narrative from John, Jesus healed one and walked away. Reminds me of the story of a father and son that were walking the beach after a Category 5 hurricane. And the father and son are there walking and they're looking out over the sand and there's all kinds of starfish. You heard this story before? And the father and son are walking, talking about all the damage and the debris washed up on the beach and the son bends over, picks up a starfish, looks at it and throws it back into the ocean. Walk a little bit longer, son stops, bends over, picks up a starfish and throws it back in the ocean. And the father says, why are you taking your time to to help this starfish? And the son bent over and picked up one and said, I might not be able to help them all, but I just made a difference in this one's life. And as we look out in our city, as we look out in our town, our nation and our world, we can't help everybody. We physically can't, we financially can't, we maybe emotionally can't, but we can make a difference in one person's life. What hope do I have to offer during physical struggles? Well, the first one is to go and show compassion. Jesus could have avoided the pool at Bethesda. He could have avoided it. He was on mission, but he went and he acknowledged and show compassion. Sometimes we just sit in our car and we just pretend like we don't see it. Because if we pretend like we don't see it, then it's not really there. And you might be saying, I don't know where to go to help. Well, we have great ministries of the Shepherd God Parent Home that need help. We have great ministries like the Mansion Church that needs help. And they just need people to come and to volunteer. People to lean in, to show compassion. Second one is, we need to point people to the creator, not the created. And this guy, he has this thought, I just need to get to the pool. And he focused on the earthly and lost perspective of the eternal. 
And you might be here this morning and you might be wrestling through very deep struggles physically. Have you lost perspective of Jesus? Just imagine this man woke up that morning, if he could sleep, and the Messiah came and said, do you want to get well? I have no one to help me. I am the one here to help you. Third challenge is to help one. Hey, we can't throw all the starfish back in the ocean. But if each one reach one, if each one help one, it'd make a difference in their life. That can be something as simple as pointing them to the mansion church if they're homeless. That could be finding someone that was standing by the stop sign and saying, hey, I'll meet you at Tim Hortons, I'll buy. And you'll get warm, you'll get a meal, and I'll drink a cup of coffee, and you can tell me your story. But I'm too busy. Maybe. But I just wonder if we each one would reach one. What impact that would make in their life and in your life. And then for all of us, I think we really need to be challenged with walking in obedience to Jesus' commands. This guy had a choice. You can get up, pick up, and walk out of here or say, you know what? I'm good. I don't want to obey. I don't want to walk in obedience. What hope do we have to offer during physical struggles? I want to end the service different this week by showing you what it might have looked like through the eyes of the movie, The Chosen. Shalom. <laughs> Me. Yes. Shalom. I have a question for you. For me. I don't have many answers, but I'm listening. Do you want to be healed? Who are you? We'll get to that later. But my question remains. Will you take me to the water? <laughs> Look, I'm having a really bad day. You've been having a bad day for a long time. So? Sir, I have no one to help me into the water when it's stirred up. And when I do get close, the others step down in front of me. And so... Look at me. Look at me. That's not what I asked. I'm not asking you about who's helping you or who's not helping or who's getting in your way. I'm asking about you. <laughs> I've tried. For a long time, I know. And you don't want false hope again, I understand. But this pool, it has nothing for you. It means nothing, and you know it. But you're still here. Why? I don't know. You don't need this pool. You only need me. So, do you want to be healed?
So let's go. Get up. Pick up your mat. And walk. to walk, like he said. Don't forget your bed. Why does this matter? Because you're not coming back here. That life is over. Everything changes now. Friends, don't leave here without knowing Jesus. Don't leave here without knowing the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one that came to die for you. So let's close our time in a word of prayer. And if you have questions, if you need extra prayer, we'll have pastoral staff in the back. We'd love to minister to you. So Lord, we thank you for the morning. We thank you for the challenge from your word. And as we leave here, we have many opportunities to encourage and to minister to many. Lord, help us to find one. Help us to show the love of Christ to one. And if there are some here that are struggling physically, Lord, I pray that you might minister to them. And through all that we say and do, would we point back to you, who is the creator. We're so thankful for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.